as we will discuss when we get to allocution, the two most powerful times in order to prepare yourself in any legal matters is before the hearing and at the end of the case. So before you ever step into a court case, consider some of the material that Ron Davenport and others have been doing in terms of uh, lodging your material first before you enter in so that that can be used as a reference for demurrer. Now there's four forms of demurrer in Canon 2841. And they are general, special, to evidence and to interrogatories. So I'll only speak to general and special at this point and we'll, well, we will cover the other two as well. So general demurrer, and this is their terms, by the way. This is all their terms. This is their rules, their terms. General demurrer is a demurrer which objects to a complaint in its substance. Okay, so it's a complaint as to the substance in failure to state the facts sufficiently or constitute a cause of action or any lack of subject matter jurisdiction. So that's a general demurrer. A special demurrer is a demurrer which objects to the complaint in its form. So unlike a general demurrer, we're now being specific. So is to the complaint in its form where there's an essential error of facts, Scrivener errors, uh, which is a technical error, errors in contradicting the public record and other special examples. So this is the one that would, one would most often use if one was going to complain uh, put lots of complaint and challenge jurisdiction it would be a special demurrer. Now a, a demurrer to evidence is effectively a demurrer which at the uh, conclusion of evidence uh, effectively seeks to have the evidence uh, struck um, because it was incorrectly presented or there's some uh, technical error. And of course a demurrer to interrogatories is the same but in the case of witnesses. Now, when can demurrers be lodged and how are they lodged? In criminal law, general or special demurrer, and this is 2842, is usually not uh, uh, requested and filed until after the presentation of any indictment because the indictment is the pleading. So until the indictment has been completed, the pleading by the pro se cutis has not been completed. So that is why the demurrer tends to correspond to the same time as a pleading and why they quite happily like to refer to demurrer as a, as a form of inferior plea. It's not an inferior plea. It's, it's a fundamental component into their system. So once the indictment is completed, they normally rush forward on the plea, which gives you the first and, and legitimate opportunity to call for demurrer. Of course, you can call for a demur at any point in the case. But if you call for it later and you are challenging uh, via demur a principle of jurisdiction, once you agree to a plea, then, of course, the case will proceed, the court will proceed, as the assumption is they have jurisdiction. In civil, a demur, of course, can be filed prior to any hearing because under civil, any kind of complaint needs to be lodged the evidence needs to be presented, the facts need to be presented, and a copy needs to be given to the other party, which would be you. Now, 2844. A presiding judge or magistrate cannot deny the right of demurrer, and they, in fact, do not deny. A judge uh, that does deny it or, or denies leave effectively... Um, uh, demonstrates a predisposed bias and a technical error and gives you immediate grounds to file to their superior to have them recused. It, uh, effectively, to deny a demurrer is, is immediate grounds for a mistrial, immediate grounds for the case to, to, to cease. And judges and magistrates know this, but this is what they do. When you hear of people that call for a demurrer, without realizing that calling for a demurrer is, a demurrer is simply asking for the opportunity to file uh, a written uh, document in line with what we've described. When one does not demonstrate a knowledge of what demurrer actually is, when one cannot even say that it's a general demurrer or a special demurrer, 
when a judge is able to establish that the person in front of them, the man or woman, I should say, in, pers- in, in front of them, is incompetent to the term they've used, then what judges will normally do is that they'll say, well, I'll, I'll enter a plea of not guilty. What they're really saying is, you've said a word having no idea what you're doing. You've said a word without indicating any uh, time that you require to prepare this. And therefore, I am going to presume that you are incompetent. And therefore, on your behalf, I'm assuming the role of guardian to enter a non-guilty plea. And that is exactly what's happening. So it's important to understand exactly what is happening uh, when people are using the word demurra, demurra, and not getting the kind of response they expect. When you say the word demurra at the plea, you're merely saying, I need time to prepare the written documentation to go into the court. That's all you're saying. I need the written material to go into the court. If you have not understood this, and you've said the word demurra, and you've found that the court has said, well, I'll enter a plea of not guilty on your behalf, then really what you've experienced is the court tested you and found that you didn't know what you were talking about. The hope then is, with this clarity on the key concept of demurra, those of you that wish to challenge a technical error of a case now know exactly what demurra is. Okay, so that's demurra. Let's now move to allocution. And like I said, a number of these things appear a bit clinical tonight in just simply reading off the, the canons, but these areas are absolutely fundamental, and we have discussed these before. I know that many of you have heard about them before, read about them. These are important elements if you are facing any kind of legal action to their courts. And here is allocution, 237, fundamental. Allocution, and 2845, allocution is the term used to define an ancient principle of law whereby an accused, having been found guilty of an offence, possesses the right to speak for one last time on the record as to their defence before any sentence is passed. This is the meaning of allocution. 2846, the right of an accused to speak to those that have convicted them of a crime before a sentence is issued is one of the oldest pillars of law since the beginning of civilization. The right to speak to those that have convicted you is one of the oldest pillars of law since the beginning of civilization. When it's denied or wholly absent, the law does not exist. Now, the word allocution is a corruption of the word adlocution, which comes from the Latin adlocutio, meaning concluding speech, final words, final speech of a play, formal address of an emperor or general. Now, if you've read the earliest sections of positive law and you've looked at the areas of rhetoric, you would have already seen the word adlocution being mentioned. The reason is that it's mentioned when we describe the concept of epilogue, a form of rhetoric. Now, in Greek law, Roman law, Anglo-Saxon law, and early common law, in fact, in all forms of law for the last close to 3,000 years, there was a custom that an accused had three opportunities in order to defend themselves, three opportunities to speak. In Greek, it was prologue, dialogue, and epilogue. In the Roman system, it was prolocution, collocution, and adlocution. Three opportunities to speak. And, and you'll be aware that in Roman law, the concept of three is embedded in many, many things. Uh, an accused must be consent three times. A sentence must be issued, uh, spoken three times. Hear ye, hear ye, hear ye. Three is key to them. And in this case, uh, for, a, for a judgment to be just, there are three opportunities for the accused to defend themselves. Prolocution, co-locution, and adlocution. 
Now, in 2848, of course, and are these things I'm referring to gives weight and also gives reference because when you are dealing with the bar, you are dealing, unfortunately, now with a level of ignorance, unprecedented ignorance. So in the case of 2848, we say the most famous use of adlocution in Western law is the adlocution of Socrates, as told by Plato, his great epilogue, his great final speech before he drank the poison cup. And we say thus, adlocution of Socrates has served as one of the one ancient pillars of Western law. The Socratic method, by questions, this is a pillar of Western law, the adlocution of Socrates. Now, if you want a, a famous non-use of adlocution or a deferral of adlocution in Western law, then look no further than the trial of Jesus by Pontius Pilate as recounted in the New Testament, where effectively he uh, denied uh, his right for prolocution, he denied his right for collocution, and he deferred his right of adlocution until he was dying on the cross. Forgive them, for they know what, not what they do. I think are the words pretty close to the deferral of his adlocution to the final, final element. So, adlocution is a fundamental part of their system and there are two examples uh, of, of its use and its right still um, deferring it to the very end. An adlocution or an allocution is always oral and no time constraint can be imposed. Now, We'll keep covering this because this is an important area and I want to get through this. 2851, during adlocution, one may refer to any evidence, whether previously admitted or refused, to be entered into the record by the court. Furthermore, adlocution may include elements of demurra in challenging the jurisdiction of the court as well as the weight of evidence presented. Now, we need to cover two elements here that, that people uh, are aware of, which is the depreciation of a fundamental right by the system. We start with the first, 2852. In the 19th century, the Roman cult, also known as the Vatican, sought to remove this 2,000-year-old fundamental right by changing spelling to allocution. And then they defined it saying that it was two things. It was a solemn private address by a Roman pontiff to the College of Cardinals, and secondly, that in its lowest use, as a privilege now, not a right, granted by the judge of the private bar guild. Let's speak to this. Prior to the 19th century, there was no evidence of allocution being a custom, custom at any point. It's a wholly fictitious smokescreen and uh, corruption introduced by the Roman cult. And in the 20th century, it got worse. Because in the 20th century, the private bar guild corrupted this so that allocution no longer, even when granted by the judge, uh, was considered on the record. Now it is an unsworn statement. So when one calls for allocution, one must know exactly the provenance, the history, and the reason for it, because it is so, so important. So important. Now, let's talk about um, 2855 and the aspect you've heard before in terms of people being able to speak in allocution or an adlocution and walking out of court. It's 2855. If an accused had previously stated a prolocution for the first time that the court had no jurisdiction and presented facts to support such claim, had then reinforced through demurra and or collocution, which is the second time, the court's lack of jurisdiction. Then for the third and final time at adlocution, speak their denial of consent and lack of jurisdiction by the court, then the court cannot lawfully detain or obstruct them from leaving the court at the conclusion of their adlocution. That is the famous story of people walking after their ad locution, their allocution. Because 